Hello everyone and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today we're doing an old school creation myth video, like the whole point of this channel, the reason this channel exists, and the kinds of videos I did way back when we started. Uh, so today we are talking about one particularly, what I find funny aspect of the Young Earth creation model specifically, post-flood hyper-evolution. What in the world is post-flood hyper-evolution, you ask? That is the extremely rapid speciation that's required once Noah's Ark lands on a mountain, two of each created kind get off, and they have to rapidly speciate into all of the things that exist today. Now, this is funny because young Earth creationists tend to not be huge fans of evolution, right? They don't think evolutionary processes can accomplish a whole lot. But here we are with those same young Earth creationists proposing evolution at rates many times faster than what actual evolutionary biologists observe and hypothesize, right? And the word for this has come to be hyper-evolution. That's what a number of non-creationists call this because it involves speciation specifically at rates that vastly exceed what we observe and what we can infer from the fossil record. Before we go any further, I want to refer everyone to Dr. Joel Duff, who has covered this for years. Uh, several of his uh, articles and videos on this are going to be linked down below, as well as his YouTube channel, and everyone should check them out. If you aren't already subscribed to Joel, make sure you subscribe to Joel. He's a great resource for all things creationism, and in particular, I love his This Week in Creationism series to just stay up to date on, like, what's going on in creationism at any given time. Also, before we go any further, I just want to be crystal clear about one thing. There was no global flood approximately 4,400 years ago, and that date is according to most young Earth creation. It's approximately 4,400 years ago. There are other sources that put it a little bit further back, but typically you hear 4,400 years. So let's be clear, there was no global Noah's flood 4,400 years ago. We have Old Kingdom Egypt that spanned the time frame from approximately 2700 BCE to 2200 BCE. The flood supposedly took place around 2400 BCE. Well, guess what happened in Old Kingdom Egypt? That's when the pyramids were built. The pyramids predate the flood. The flood would have destroyed the pyramids. Nobody can possibly dispute this. There's no way to say that the pyramids would have survived the flood given the level of destruction and geological reorganization that was happening in the world. But the pyramids are there. We can directly date them to Old Kingdom Egypt between 27 and 2200 BCE. And by the way, the Great Pyramids at Giza, which is what we're looking at here, are not the only pyramids. There's lots of periods spanning that whole time frame, so you can't just say, oh, the flood and then the pyramids, right? It doesn't work. There's no break in Egyptian history. And there's no no way to fit a global flood into that known and directly documented history. So I want to be very clear about that before we go any further. This is all nonsense from top to bottom. There was no flood. But let's put Old Kingdom Egypt completely aside. Let's pretend that's not a problem at all. Here's the problem creationists have to solve. You have to get from the Ark kinds, right, the two of each kind that get off the Ark, about 4,400 years ago, to all of the extant species that exist in the present day. <clears throat> now, we're going to round to about 4,000 years as our window to generate all that species diversity, because we've been paying pretty close attention for the last few hundred years, right? So let's call it 4,000 years to get all of those species. Now, also remember that each created kind is descended from just two individuals. There are some exceptions, right? The clean animals, it's seven pairs or maybe 49. It's a little bit ambiguous for the clean animals, uh, according to Leviticus, but that list of clean animals is relatively short, so we don't have to worry about it. We're just going to say two of each kind. It's also worth noting that kind is usually... Uh, treated as equivalent to a family in our modern classification system. So, for example, Felidae for the cat kind, or Canidae for the dog kind. According to Answers in Genesis and their Ark Encounter theme park, there were 1,398 kinds on the Ark. 
And remember, you don't just have to get from two of each kind to all the living species. You also need to generate all of the extinct species within each kind as well, because the vast majority of those specimens that we've documented are in rocks that most young Earth creationists would agree are post-flood formations. So that means you have to have a lot of evolution happening in not a lot of years. And just to be clear about it, we're talking about speciation here. And despite the protest from young Earth creationists, speciation equals evolution, okay? Speciation is evolution happening. Let's all just be clear on that. Here are some specific numbers that highlight the scale of the problem. Young Earth creationists must account for three existing species and over 180 extinct species of the elephant kind, 36 existing species and over 150 extinct species of the dog kind, and 41 existing species and about 120 extinct species of the cat kind. Obviously, that's a lot of speciation happening very quickly. And that's a particular problem for creationists who outright deny most of evolutionary theory. It sure seems like they not only accept that evolution happens, because again, speciation is evolution happening, but they need to hit fast forward in order for their specific model to work. Now, a number of creationists have tried to find a solution to this problem of how do we get all these species so fast. So Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson from Answers in Genesis, for example, has his created heterozygosity and natural processes model. And he's written on this. Uh, he talked about it in his book, uh, Replacing Darwin. It's a common thing that he talks about. Now, I've explained in detail with actual numbers why created heterozygosity doesn't work. And that video this one is linked down below. The short version is that with a maximum of 10 alleles for each human locus, and just four for most animal kinds when you get off the ark, the rate of recombination as we observe it today is just too slow to generate all the variation that exists in humans and other animals. So there are like some human genes, for example, some loci in the human genome that have over 1,000 variants. So if you're going to generate that, as Jeanson proposes, almost entirely due to recombination rather than mutation, we're talking about recombination rates that exceed the observed rate of recombination by several orders of magnitude. And again, all the details, including walking through real numbers, are in that video, which you can find down below. Jeanson has a particularly funny error here, because one of the components of his CHNP model is that he predicts, I'm putting it in quotes because it's too general to be any kind of specific prediction, but he predicts a higher than expected speciation rate, and then uses an observed example of speciation among Galapagos finches as validation of his prediction. But unfortunately for him, that new species was due to hybridization, not Jeanson's proposed mechanism. So even if you grant him everything else, that example doesn't count in his favor, right? What he's doing with this little, uh, little victory lap that he takes when uh, they found this new species of finch is he's doing the equivalent of predicting it's going to get dark outside because the sun will go out, and then saying his prediction was accurate when the sun went down. Some creations have gone even further and proposed additional built-in germline diversity as a potential explanation. Now, to be fair, not many creationists have actually endorsed this idea, right? They don't like actively promote it to the same degree that they promote created heterozygosity. But some big name creationists like Dr. Rob Carter and Dr. John Sanford have proposed this idea. And uh, this is from the proceedings of the 2018 International Conference on Creationism. So, I mean, this is a legitimate idea among professional creation scientists. So, according to the people who propose and describe this idea, it could lead to an explosion of biodiversity within just a few generations of the end of the flood. Needless to say, there's no evidence for any of this. It invokes an untestable miracle, and we don't have to pay it any more attention. So creationists don't have a good answer for how all of this speciation is supposed to take place within only about 4,000 years. Hang on. Did I say 4,000 years? I'm sorry, that's wrong. What I should have said was 
creationists don't have a good answer for how all this speciation is supposed to take place within only about 300 years. Why only 300 years? Because of Middle Kingdom Egypt. Middle Kingdom Egypt spanned from about 2000 to 1700 BCE. There's some wiggle room in those numbers, and I apologize to any Egypt historians if I've offended you and I'm off by an unacceptable amount. But as far as I can tell, those are the approximate years for Middle Kingdom Egypt. You're looking at 2000 to 1700 BCE. Now remember, the flood, according to most young earth creationists, is approximately 2400 BCE which means we have this thriving society in Egypt with robust historical records just 400 years after the Flood. And we also have to account for the post-Flood Ice Age that, according, again, in general, according to most young Earth creationists, lasted about a century in the aftermath of the Flood. So there's going to be a lot less diversification during that Ice Age, which means you really have to start about 4,300 years ago or about 2,300 BCE. So you only have 300 years from when you can really start generating a lot of variation to Middle Kingdom Egypt. And I want to emphasize the importance of Middle Kingdom Egypt because we have a lot of direct records of modern animals from Middle Kingdom Egypt, right? Cats, waterfowl, reptiles, birds of prey, and not just some amorphous like intermediate ancestral species, but records of modern species. And you don't have to take my word for it that this is a thing young earth creationists have to grapple with. You could just look at this episode of the Let's Talk Creation podcast with Todd Wood and Paul Garner. They describe this exact problem. They talk about it in the context of camels, using, very notably, both Egyptian history and the Bible to show how modern species existed just a few hundred years after the Flood. So we don't have 4,000 years for all of the extant species to evolve and for all of the extinct species to appear and then die out. We only have about 300 years for all of that to happen. So all of those numbers I provided a few minutes ago for how many existing and extinct species you need for this or that family, they were already insurmountable for creationists, and they just got about 13 times worse. So now, instead of a new species of cat every 25 years, it's one every two years. Instead of a new species of dog every 22 years, it's one every one and a half years. And best of all, instead of a new species of elephant every 22 years, it's again one every one and a half years. And that last example, the elephant kind, is particularly brutal for creationists. Because elephants have an average generation time, not lifespan, they have a much longer lifespan, but they have an average generation time of 22 to 31 years, a gestation time of 22 months, almost two full years. And they usually have fewer than 10 calves in a lifetime, almost always one at a time. That means for elephants to get from the ark pair to all the extinct and existing biodiversity that we've documented, you need to have a new species literally every generation, at least one new species every generation. That's the kind of like Pokemon style evolution that creationists will build as a straw man when they're making fun of evolutionary theory, right? That's not how evolution actually works. That's like Kent Hovind level, have you ever seen a dog give birth to a non-dog kind of thing? But that's necessitated by the young earth model given the time constraints and the number of species we have to generate. By the way, if you think I'm being unfair with my numbers here, Answers in Genesis says, Order Probosidae, which contains all the elephants, is a single created kind, and it contains over 180 extinct members in addition to the three species of elephant that exist today. I'm using numbers from creationists here. Don't come after me for using their numbers. Now, I need to credit friends of the channel Guts of Gibbon and Just a Walking Fish for that elephant analysis. They actually did a video on that exact thing a few years ago. You can find a much more detailed account in that video. Uh, I've linked that video down below. It's great. I highly, highly recommend it. 
So take all of what we just went through, and obviously post-flood hyper-evolution is not a viable idea. It's an ad hoc workaround to the problems inherent to the young Earth model, and it collapses under the slightest scrutiny. Hyper-evolution is a creation myth. Thank you all for watching, everyone. Please remember to hit like, uh, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, consider becoming a channel member to get access to pre-recorded videos like this right away instead of having to wait for the public release. As always, don't get fooled.